Good morning again. Uh, We're going to be looking at James again. This is our third week. We're looking at the book of James, Wisdom for Every Day Life. And today, we're going to be looking at a section from James in chapter 1. And I've added some additional verses to what already are printed in your guide this morning. I would point out to you that there's a lot of benefit from being together and hearing a message, and reflecting on the teachings of James, but the benefit would be magnified if you'll take James home and read it on your own. Pick up a couple of different translations and read to the translations. Write your questions, your thoughts down, and how does it interact with your life? How does it impact the way that you live and love like Jesus every day? You ready for some good words? All right. So James writes, Blessed is anyone who endures temptation. The word there can mean test, trial. Such a one has stood the test and will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. No one when tested, tempted, put on trial should say I'm being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself tempts no one. But one is tempted, tested, put on trial by one's own desire, being lured and enticed by it. And then when that desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And that sin, when it is fully grown, gives birth to death. Do not be deceived, my beloved. He's talking about here the capacity to deceive ourselves. Then he says, every generous act of giving with every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change, meaning that God is good and generous and light in darkness and brings light to us and life to us and does not change and is consistent. In fulfillment of God's own purpose, he gave us birth by the word of truth so that we would become a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Would you pray with me? God, today as we consider these words of wisdom from James, may you give us the courage, the humility, and the vulnerability to look inside of ourselves and to allow you to lead and discipline and manage and search our hearts. In the name of Jesus. Amen. All our accomplishments, anything that we hope to accomplish with our life, any endeavor that we put great effort into, anything that we want to achieve, the desire to have a healthy, long, meaningful marriage, the desire to raise healthy, good children, working hard at having meaningful, rich, and developed friendships. If you're a person that wants to leave a legacy, leave a mark on the world, let the world be better because you were in it. If you want to get up every day and bring your very best to the world, because anything that you want to accomplish, whatever your heart says your dreams are, It can all be undone, unraveled by one thing. All of it, one thing. The failure to pay attention to what's happening in your heart. The failure to manage and to discipline your desires, your passions, your thoughts, and your feelings. The failure to do so 
can unravel anything that you want to do in your life. That's what James is talking about here in this book, in this passage we just read. James is this real practical book. And in this book, he talks at the beginning about adversity, the adversity that knocks us to our, to our knees and knocks the breath out of us, how we face adversity. But here he shifts to talking about a different kind of adversity, the adversity that comes from within inside of us, from our cravings, from our desires. And he says here that what we dwell on, what we think about, what we allow to become rooted inside of us is that very thing that will take life, in, take life on in us and will show up in the way we live. Why do we say the things that we do to others? Why do we show up in the world the way we do? Where do our actions come from? He says they all come from a source. They all come from inside and from our unwillingness, our inattention to pay attention to our desires. Because you all know, we all know that inside of us we have good feelings, negative feelings, unhealthy cravings and desires, unholy things in us, holy things, noble things, and unnoble things. And what James is saying here is probably one of the most important things you can do for your life to have a good, meaningful life is to gain a sense of mastery, mastery over your inner life. It's really interesting, there's a word here he uses when he says that our desires entice us and tempt us and then they conceive something in us and then they bloom into sin and they lead to death or harm in our life. The Greek word here is harmatia, harm, harmatia. It means to be misled, it means to err, it means to miss the mark. But interesting enough, enough to me was when I discovered from Greek literature that it means a tragic flaw that brings the downfall of a hero. Think about, think about it for a minute. In the last couple of years, for example, can you think of anybody in public life who had charisma and power and influence, who was living this huge life, making a difference in the world, making some kind of impact on the world, and their whole life was brought down by something that was shocking and surprising. We all can. It happens almost all the time. And you ask, how does that happen? Where did that come from? I didn't see it coming. You didn't see it coming because where did it start? It all starts on the inside of us. And that's true not just for people in public life, but for all of us. The greatest threat to your life and to my life and to our relationships isn't necessarily external threats, but it's about is what's inside of us. Because what's inside of us, if we dwell on things that are not good for us in our hearts, will bring ruin to our relationships and to our friendships. For instance, uh, I've been reading a book by David McCullough called uh, 1776, which is uh, about, essentially it's about George Washington. And before reading the book, I was really unfamiliar with George Washington other than just the basics of the story. But I found out that when he was appointed uh, the head of the Continental Army, he had all kinds of misgivings about the task that was ahead of him and his ability to be successful. He was worried about his own gifts, his own skills, his own ability to, to make it happen. And he was facing just terrible odds. They were poorly resourced and greatly outnumbered by the greatest fighting force in human history at that time. He was also going to have to pull together a ragtag group of undisciplined, poorly equipped soldiers to do the, to do the work. And so he was... All throughout this effort, through the, all throughout the Revolutionary War, he always presented himself as calm and confident and hope-filled and eyes on the prize. But on the inside, he was filled with doubt and a sense of insecurity and a sense of worry and a sense of fear. But because he had a sense of mastery over his internal life, and because he had a goal in mind, he did not allow the fear in his heart, the fear in his life, 
to, to misguide him, to mislead him. And so can you imagine what would have happened, the result of the Revolutionary War, if the most important figure who would become president of the United States had not gained some level of mastery on the inside? Now, where does this come from? This is not unique to James. It came from Jesus. Because when you look at all of Jesus' Jesus teachings, he has this one thing he says over and over again, in, in my own words. He says, if you really want to change your life, you've got to change your heart. He says that you want to know where the fruit on the tree came from? Look inside a person's heart. You want to know where all wickedness and all evil, all sin, all meanness, all cruelty, where does it come? It all comes from inside a person's heart. And he says, we don't just want to change our outward behavior. We want to change our inward thoughts and feelings, which will show up in a better way in the world. And so he talks about, don't just wash the outside of your life. Wash the inside of your life. Do you know that's the genius of a 12-step program, Alcoholics Anonymous or Narcotics Anonymous? Because if you struggle with alcohol and you go to an AA meeting, they don't focus on stopping drinking, telling you not to drink. They don't work on your behavior. What they focus on is on the internal life. Because in a 12-step program, they recognize a fundamental truth about alcoholism that the, the, the drinking is a symptom of the disease of an internal spiritual struggle. So when they focus on helping the person get their life in order, they focus on what's inside, what it is that drives that behavior, what it is that's driving the addiction. You ever heard this term, a dry drunk? Do you know what a dry drunk is? A dry drunk is a person who has quit drinking but they're not sober. What that means is they've stopped the behavior, but they've not dealt with the inner rage, the inner shame, the embarrassment, the guilt, all those things that that lead them to drink. And so as a result, you can see it in their lives, these dry drunks, because they white-knuckle it. They're just trying to just change their behavior, but not dealing what's inside. And so it's forced, it's, it's hard, it's difficult. James is saying the same thing in this book. Because in this book, he talks about all kinds of everyday issues. How you handle money and possessions. How you treat people who are differently from you. How you deal with your, your thoughts about people you disagree with. How you use your mouth. How you, how you respond when you're angry. How, how you make the most of your time. And what James is doing here at the very beginning of this book is saying, if you want to get some real success in this part of your life, if you want to have healthy relationships and a healthy relationship with money and finances, and you want to use your mouth in a way that's a blessing to the world, then you got to look at your heart. you got to change your heart because otherwise you're going to be white-knuckling it. And every now and then, you're going to get a Delta variant breaking through. Meaning, the behavior you don't want is going to break through because you haven't addressed the inner spiritual struggle. You're familiar with Steve Jobs because you probably have an iPhone. In 2005, Steve Jobs gave a commencement speech at Stanford. It's the most viewed commencement speech uh, in human history. 40 million views. In it, he... At that moment in time, he is battling cancer. He's facing possibly the end of his life. He would die a few years later. But he talks to these students about why he quit college, dropped out of college. He talks about a moment when he was fired uh, from Apple. And then he talks about facing death. And it was an unusual and profound talk because he shows vulnerability that he had never really shown in public before. And then he ends with this quote, the most quoted part of the speech. He says, your time is limited, so don't waste it. Living someone else's life. Have the courage to follow your heart and intuition. They somehow already know what you truly want to become. Follow your heart. Don't live someone else's advice. Now, 
That just sounds like really good advice, and there's nothing strange about that to you or to me, because why? That is the American gospel. It's the Disney gospel, that the way to happiness is to follow your heart. And there's some truth there, I don't want to malign it, that you should live your own authentic life because it is yours to live. But I want to tell you something. It is the absolute worst advice you could ever give another human being to tell them to follow their heart. Because their heart will lead them, if it's an undisciplined, unmanaged, unsupervised, unsurrendered heart, our hearts are not supposed to guide us. It will lead you right into the ditch. I, I, 30, 30 years of ministry, I've heard people say, well, why did you do that? Well, I would just follow my heart. How did that turn out for you? Sometimes good, sometimes not so good. I remember sitting in my office with a woman, and she had left her marriage and left two children behind who were elementary age because she fell in love with another man who lived in another city, and she moved 300 miles away, and she was now sitting in my congregation, and she was unhappy and trying to figure out why she was unhappy when she had followed her heart. And she said, what do you think? And I said, do you really want to know what I think? I said, your heart has nothing to do with this. You need to go home and be a mother. I don't know if your marriage is good or not, but you're a mother. And sometimes following your heart is the worst thing that you could ever do. You need to put aside what you're feeling because you can't always trust it. You need to go home and take care of your kids. You know what she did? I never saw her again. Either she went home or she chose another church. <laughs> if I follow my heart, what my heart wants, I'm going to be in trouble because my heart wants beer and food all day and donuts. <laughs> my heart, because my heart feels something, doesn't mean that it's good for me. I feel all kinds of things. Some things are noble and not so noble. When somebody does something to me, I want to get even. I get mad. We have all kinds of things inside of us. Nowhere in the Bible does it ever say, follow your heart. It says, follow Jesus, because our hearts are not supposed to be followed. Our hearts need to be led, led, not followed, discipled, surrendered, managed, leaded, guided, examined. We are saying, Lord, I can't trust my own heart and my own desires because they will lead me to a place that I might not want to go, but I trust you. I believe in you. I know what you want from me. And so as your disciple, here it is. So a personal story. Today, this afternoon, I'm flying to Texas, to Houston, to do a funeral. A few weeks ago, I talked about a man who has had a big influence on in my life, mentored me, and many others. I preached about him a few weeks ago, and when the family somehow or another got a hold of our sermon, they said, would you come and tell that story? And out of respect for him and for his life, I, I said, you know, yes, I would go. So I'm flying down there, and of all things, of all things, it's going to take place in a chapel where a big moment of transformation occurred for me, a great enlightenment occurred for me. It's going to happen at the Woodlands United Methodist Church, which is one of the largest United Methodist churches in the United States. My church was just down the street from them, and I used to, when I was the pastor at the smaller church, called them the Methodome, or Six Flags Over Jesus, because it was so big. <laughs> and I would say that, I would say that, you laugh, I said that, but it was not positive. We're not supposed to talk about our brothers and sisters in Christ that way, but I was working hard, and we were doing the best we can, and that church just made it all look easy. They were growing, they were building, they had money, they had resources, and we had to fight and claw for everything we did, and, you know, they had all the powerful people, and, and all, you know, and I just got frustrated and envious, and every time I would drive by that building, I just had bad feelings. Why? Because I'm competitive. I'm envious. I'm jealous. And all these things begin to happen inside, inside my heart. 
One, part, one time I'm driving by and I finally said, I got to do something about this. And so I drove into the lot. It was just, I drove into the lot and I went into their building and went into their chapel. Beautiful, bigger than this room, more beautiful than the whole building I was served, the place I was serving. I walked in, I sat down, and I just began to pray and said, this is unholy what's in my heart. I can't continue to live this way. It's not right. I need to be able to celebrate the successes of other people. I know this is not right. I know this is not what you want from me. And I'm in there for quite a long time. When a staff person, from the, a minister from the church walks in, sees me, sits down next to me, and puts his arm on me, on my shoulder. He says, isn't this an amazing place? We're so blessed. I'm going, oh, you know. <laughs> and he just starts talking about all the things that the church was doing and trying to accomplish. And then I said, well, how are you doing? Whole conversation changes. You know, I'm not so good. This is a hard place to work. Good people, but I just work all the time, you know. It's hard to sustain the pace of being here. Everything's always moving, always changing. I feel like my soul can't catch up to the speed of the place. And he said, I find, I find that my wife is doing all the parenting. You know, it's causing some hardship at home, and I'm missing my kids while they're growing up. And then he looks at me, and he says, David, would you pray for me? I put my hand on his hand and his hand on his shoulder, and I prayed for him. He thanked me, got up, and left. And then I prayed this prayer. Thank you, God, for not giving me the thing that I thought my heart wanted and desired. And you know what happened after that? I got called to be the pastor of a church in Louisville, Kentucky, next door to a church that worships 30,000 people. If I had not dealt with that, and I continue to struggle with all those feelings because I am really competitive, it would have done me in. We would have never had this. We need to be able to celebrate others. Think about this for a minute. If George Bailey <laughs> had followed his heart when his dad had a heart attack, and he'd followed his heart to travel the world, the savings and loan would have gone bankrupt. And Bedford Falls would have become Pottersville. <laughs> I end with this prayer. And I want you to pray with me. This, is, this will make such a difference for you, me, all of us in becoming, if we're going to live in love like Jesus, folks, we got to get in here. we got to be vulnerable and humble. We can't just pretend. We have to give it up and surrender. David, who had a heart for God, wrote Psalm 139. And this was the prayer at the end. Would you join with me? And may this be our prayer. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me. And know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting.